it's interesting that just recently I was reading this book, Why Does the World Exist? by Jim Holt, who lives here in New York. He's a science uh, journalist, very good writer. He has written another book recently. Um, uh, it already hit the bestseller charts. The book is called When Einstein Wo Walked with Godel. Um, you know, in Princeton, there is an in uh, institute called the Institute of Advanced Studies, IAS, in, in Princeton University. And the, I heard the story how it was established that in, after the Depression, there was this very rich businessman who made an endowment to Princeton to establish the best science institute ever. And uh, this gentleman was not very highly educated, but he wanted best people to come to this institute. And so he said, hire the best physicist. Who is the best physicist? And the director at that time, president said, best physicist? Well, Einstein. Well, hire him. Mm -hmm. Hire <laughs> Einstein? Why should he come here? At that time, Princeton itself, Princeton itself was not so well known also. Why should Einstein come here? Anyhow, hire him. So he made an offer to Einstein, who was in Germany. And lo and behold, at that time, Professor Einstein was trying to get out of Germany, escape from Hitler. So when he got this offer, he said, fine, but I need so much money that to settle, resettle in the United States. This much salary I must be given. And when they said to the donor that Einstein is willing to come, actually, and this much, he wants this much salary, and the donor said, triple it into three and ask him to come over. And he, that's how Einstein came here, in the, the Princeton Institute of Advanced Studies. And then next the donor asked, who is the greatest mathematician in the world? He said, Kurt Godel, Godel's incompleteness theorem. Get him. And they actually got him. So, <laughs> and Einstein, the story goes, he was very, um, you know, very popular and, and, and a very amiable person. So he made friends with everybody, he'd walk around. And Godel was just the opposite. He was suspicious of everybody, cold and forbidding figure. The only friend he had was Einstein here. And the, these two, the greatest geni geniuses of the 20th century, they would take walks on the lawn there, or you know, they would walk together. And so that's how the book is named, When Einstein Walked with Go Godel uh, here. But his earlier book, which is very interesting, Why Does the World Exist? And I'll show you the relationship, what, what I'm going to speak about. This gentleman, he thought, Jim Holt, he thought that the greatest question is, why is there something rather than nothing? And so he goes around asking this question. What explanation is there for the origin of this universe? World by world, he means the entire universe, everything. What is the origin of this? And is it Big Bang? He goes to physicists and asks, can physics explain the origin of the universe? Is it uh, God? Is God the origin of the universe? He goes to the top theologians of the world, not only in New York, he goes to uh, Oxford University in different places in Europe and asks them, could God the concept of God explain the universe. He goes to mathematicians, um, famously Sir Roger Penrose, who is a mathematical physicist, um, and a very beautiful interview with him. Can you explain the uh, origin of the universe from mathematics? Uh, I remember that I had once heard Sir Roger Penrose uh, give a talk. You know, his very famous book, Emperor's New Mind. I, I had heard him give a talk in Calcutta. It was sponsored by the British Council. So Sir Roger came there and gave a talk. And I was, uh, what struck me was, first of all, this cutting-edge physicist in the world today. The talk he gave was entirely on no computers, no projectors or PowerPoint, entirely on this, you know, this transparency. The older people here will know it. OHP overhead projector. He was using that and he was drawing little, little squiggles. And his presentation was quite amazing, even from a Vedantic standpoint, because his point was, what puzzles him is, this amazing congruence between human consciousness, physics, and mathematics. Mathematics, he drew a triangle. Mathematics, physics, human consciousness. The universe, what he called the platonic world of numbers, and human consciousness. How are the three connected? Because obviously they are connected. We understand mathematics and do mathematics. We understand the universe through physics. <coughs> and mathematics explains a lot of physics. Math mathematics is used to make physics discoveries. And uh, the three seem to be connected, and yet they should not be connected. So that was his uh, theme. Anyhow, Jim Holt goes and asks all these people, ask these questions. And the result is he has put in a book. If you are eagerly listening, well, what is the answer? There's no final answer given. They don't look for the answer, but 
enjoy the journey when you read that book exactly the same question is taken up by Gaudapada 1400 years ago how does the universe originate what are the available theories so like Jim Holt Gaudapada goes around asking the different philosophers of the time give me your theories how does the universe originate so he takes up broadly speaking I'm going to summarize a lot here very quickly this is basically the subject of causality cause of not not cause of one thing the seed is the cause of the tree parents are the cause of children not just one thing cause of everything what is the cause of everything in the universe the universe itself so that's that question the cause the question of causality and Gaudapada will go on to establish non-causality there is no causality ultimately that's what he wants to establish now he takes up the various theories of causality available in Indian philosophy at that time so the first one he takes up see basically he talks about a theory of the Nyaya Vaisheshikas the logicians then he talks about the theory of the Sankhyas then he talks about the theory of of karma theory of karma he talks about a theory offered by the Vish later by the Vishishtadvaitins. At that time, the Vishishtadvaitins had not originated that particular theory. But anyway, he talks about the Buddhistic approach to it. And finally, he talks about the Upanishads themselves. Because the Upanishads themselves offer many theories about the origin of the universe. And refutes all of them. Including, strangely enough, even the Upanishads. But he doesn't refute it. He explains it in a different way. So what does he say? Very quickly, I'm going to cruise through it very fast. I'm not going to go into the depths. They are very subtle issues and prolonged uh, debates are there. Between each school of ca causality, the debates have lasted for more than a thousand years, 1500 years or so. So I'm going to summarize that in five minutes. But very quickly, the Nyaya Vaisheshika school, um, there are two schools actually, Nyaya and Vaisheshika, but they are known as sister philosophies because they don't have too many conflicts between themselves. They are realists. And their idea of um, causality is called Asat Karyavada. The technical term Asat Karyavada means non pre existence of the effect in the cause. What does that mean? Does the, when the cause gives rise to the effect, did the effect exist in any form in the cause earlier or is it entirely new? Is it entirely new? Now these might sound peculiar, they are not because there are modern counterparts to all of these. Even today we are discussing this. The whole idea of emergence, a theory of emergence, that new properties do they emerge out of which were previously non-existing. So this is exactly what the Nayaikas are saying, that the universe as such did not exist earlier but by a combination of fundamental particles and they talk about fundamental particles they talk about eternity of space and free floating particles which they call atoms in fact the Indian word in all Indian languages Anu the uh, word used for atoms comes from the Vaisheshika uh, philosopher Kanada um, so the atomic theory that what happens is that from, from, a pre from a cause where the effect did not exist earlier, it arises. Now, Gaudapada immediately cuts it down. He says that if the, the effect did not exist in any form at all in the cause, there was no link with the cause, then anything can arise from anything. You see, uh, an apple, apple tree might as well come up from a mango seed because there is no link between the cause and the effect. The, there is... Uh, um, uh, so, so what is the link between cause and effect if the effect arises uh, come without any uh, previous existence in the cause? So that is the, uh, very briefly speaking, the problem with Asat Karyavada. That means the spontaneous emergence of the effect. Um, here the effect is the whole universe. Again, I'm just, when I was reading that, I'm just amazed to see Exactly the same thing is being discussed, but in the modern language of quantum physics by Jim Holt, when he goes to meet uh, quantum physicists, they're talking about how the universe emerged. The standard idea we hear about is the Big Bang theory, but then the question arises, see Jim Holt's question is, 
that uh, where did it come from? What is the cause? So if you, for the Big Bang also you can ask what is the cause? So the answer given by quantum <laughs> mechanics now, again I'm speaking without knowing what I'm speaking about. Not just because of San Diego last night, but also I'm not a physicist. So physicists among you will know better what they're talking about. He get, offers a variety of explanations which he got from interviewing different physicists. He says uh, at the quantum level things get weird, he says that um, particles pop in and out of existence <coughs> randomly so it will look like out of nothing it has come out of nothing it has come uh, so did the universe come from nothing uh, so that's what the preliminary answer he gets from the physicists and that seems to be like the Nyaya Vaisheshika theory and non-existing effect arises from the cause entirely new and Jim Holt comes to the same conclusion as Gaudapada, that that cannot be. That something did not exist earlier, how can non-existence give rise to existence? And when he asked this question, this is a direct echo of, in the Chandogya Upanishad, Asata Kadam Sadjayeta, how can existence come out of non-existence? Existence comes out of previous existence. And as he probes further, the quantum uh, physicists tell him, Actually, you are right that uh, quantum flux is not non-existence. It's not that the particles ca come out of nothing. There is a, actually, the word, the, the, the phrase he uses, very interesting phrase. Nothingness is unstable. <laughs> Nothingness is unstable. That means it seems that the quantum vacuum is actually full of virtual particles and lots of ghostly hap happenings which give rise to actual particles in, in our, our universe. So it's not absolute nothing. Uh, so there is something going on and a lot going on there which can be described mathematically or at least statistically. That brings us to the second theory which is the Sankhya Yoga theory which is called Satkarya Vada. Universe emerges not from nothing but from a previously existing something. Uh, the effect ex pre-existed in the cause in a hidden form and it was manifested. So Cause to effect is not a new creation, but rather the manifestation of a previously hidden potential. Now, this is a very sophisticated idea of causation. It tallies very well with mo modern understanding. So, for example, uh, when a mango seed gives rise to a mango tree, the mango tree in its potential, now we know, it definitely existed in the DNA, in the seed itself. Uh, it couldn't have come out any other way. So the, the information is already coded into the cause and that is only expressed as the effect. Whether it is a mango tree or it's the entire universe, in some potential form it must have existed in the cause. And now what is creation? It is just manifestation of an unmanifest effect. The, manif the effect was unmanifest, hidden in the cause, now it is manifested. So it is called Sat Karya Vada. The effect pre-existed in the cause in a hidden form, in a potential form. This Satkarya Vada is a fundamental theory. It is the most popular theory of causation in Indian philosophy, accepted by Sankhya and Yoga and in some form by Vedanta, in a modified form by Vedanta also. Gaudapada will have nothing of it. He cuts it down immediately. He says, see, according to the Sankhya, Prakriti, Composed of Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. I'm going very fast. I'm not going to explain anything here. Prakriti composed of Sattva, Rajas, Tamas is an unmanifest reality, but it is unstable. I mean, I'm, I'm always amazed at how his language parallels what Jim Holt is interviewing, Penrose and, and a number of other top physicists. Exactly the same language. Of course, I'm not saying Gaudapada knew physics or knew mathematics and all of that. But the principle... He's so amazingly, it's, it's exactly shadowing. He's, uh, the, the Sankhyans say, Prakriti is unstable. Though it's unmanifest, it looks like nothing. It's unstable. It produces, it changes into the universe. Now the Sankhyans insist Prakriti, the root nature, is eternal and yet changing. And that's where Gaudapada catches. If it is eternal, it cannot be unchanging. It, it cannot be changing. It must be in some sense eternal and unchanging. If it changes into the universe, it cannot be eternal. It's gone now. So this crucial 
place uh, Gaudapada catches the Sankhyans. How can an eternal, unchanging Prakriti give rise to a changing universe? How can it change, actually change into the, uh, the universe? This is where Gaudapada catches and he lets go of that theory. Then comes another theory, the law of karma, which is uh, a favorite among all Indian philosophers, except Gaudapada. <laughs> he doesn't like it. The law of karma states basically, law of karma is, is causality at its essence. All effects have causes and every cause will have a consequence and effect. So whatever we are experiencing in our own lives and in the physical universe, all have their effects in the past. And whatever we do now and whatever is happening now in the physical universe, all will have their effects in the future. Now Gaudapada asks this question, if this entire universe is a product of our karma, then where did this karma come from? So you see, the answer is usually past lives. And then where did those past lives come from? From the previous karma of the earlier lives. And where did those earlier lives come from? So lives before that. Immediately you'll ask the question, where did it all start? Where did the first karma start? There is an answer. The uh, people who, who propound the law of karma, they say, the first karma did not start. It is meaningless to speak about the first karma. It's a beginningless series. Gaurapada immediately catches. A beginningless series, anadi in Sanskrit, a beginningless series sounds suspiciously, suspiciously like an endless series also. Mm -hmm. That which is without beginning can, probably has no end. If it has no end, then moksha, liberation, the whole point of these Indian philosophies, moksha, nirvana, it's not possible. If you are caught in an unending chain of karma, cause and effect, effects become causes, causes become effects, then you will keep on going through karma and births and deaths. There is no escape then. And supposing, supposing you say, no, there is an escape. Karma comes to an end. Our cycle of births and deaths comes to an end. All the Indian philosophies want to say this, except the materialist, the Charvaka. Um, the Hindus and the Jains and the Buddhists, they all want to say liberation is possible, moksha is possible, nirvana is possible. Gaurapada, of course, is, an, uh, is immediately he catches there. He says, oh, then karma is real. Yes. And karma has an end. Yes. And that leads to moksha. Moksha begins after karma ends. Yes. That which begins also must come to an end. Mm -hmm. If moksha begins, then it, it has a beginning, it will probably have an end. The Buddha himself said, all compounded things fall apart. That which has a beginning will also have an end. If moksha has a beginning, if nirvana has a beginning, if freedom has a beginning, it will end in bondage. So it dispenses with the karma theory. Now, <laughs> he's going to ruin everything. <laughs> <laughs> then comes the, um, what later became the Vishishta Dvaita theory, that it's not that something produced something else, it is one integral whole. Um, this universe was not actually produced by something, Brahman or Prakriti or something, but it is the body of God. Vishishta Dvaita says there is one divine unity in this universe. It's not one cause and effect. Within the universe there is cause and effect, but the entire universe was not produced by something else. The entire universe is eternal, the body of God. So this is all Brahman. Then Gaurapada asks, but within the universe you accept change? Causes become effects. Obviously there is change. If this is real, yeah. parents give birth to children, parents die, children grow up, then children die, and the grandchildren grow up. Um, the world rotates and seasons change. There is continuous change here. Yes, within the universe there is change. But this universe you said is a part of Brahman, the eternal reality? Yes. So Brahman is subject to change? No, a part is subject to change and uh, the rest is not subject to change. So Brahman is a composite uh, unity, like uh, a part of which is always changing and part unchanging. Uh, and then he gives the example uh, of a chicken. Um, you uh, eat the top half and expect the bottom to lay eggs also. <laughs> <laughs> Gaurapada does not give that example. Shankaracharya gives that example. And so Gaurapada gives up this half-baked theory <laughs> that uh, part of it can change and part of it cannot change and they are all part of the same thing. Then, uh, then you are, you are actually admitting God can change and grow old and die, basically. 
that does not make sense to Gaurapada. Then he comes uh, along comes the the last one he takes up is the Buddhist approach. The Buddhist approach is you know, not so much a theory of origination that there is a world. Their approach is artha kriya karitvam, which means practical efficiency, practical efficacy. You cannot dismiss the world. This is one school of Buddhism actually. This is one school of Buddhism. Uh, you cannot dismiss the world because it works. You feel thirsty, you drink water, you're thirsty, satisfied. You get into a car and drive, you go from um, the Vedanta society to um, the um, Empire State Building. It works. Everything works in the world. What you, what you see, because it has practical efficiency, it must work. Because if it was false, he says, Gaurapada, you claim that the world is an appearance. If it was false, like the water in a mirage, and I went to drink that water in a mirage, I, it wouldn't satisfy my thirst. So that I can say it's false because it does not work in, in reality. It has no practical value. But this universe has practical value. Uh, it, it, is called, it has got utility. That utility shows that it, ha it is real. Uh, that's the Buddhistic approach. It's not exactly a theory of origination. But Gaurapada immediately says that, uh, but in dreams, if you were to feel thirsty and you took up a glass of water, what water? Dream water. You drank it. It would satisfy your thirst. What thirst? Dream thirst. But when you woke up, you would see that there was no, no such water and the thirst also was, was not real um, uh, in, in the waking state. In which case, though it worked, afterwards when you wake up, you deny the whole thing. You don't say that I drank water in my dream. I don't need any water now. No. So it could work in a dream and yet it could still be a dream. Again, I see how contemporary these theories are. The whole of pragmatism, William James, Charles Pierce, it's a classic American philosophy, pragmatism, is based on utility and truth. So if it works, it's real. And it has its effects in, it has its uses in the world of philosophy. But ultimately, the universe, because it works, because it can give you practical value and therefore it is real, no. That argument, Gaurapada doesn't buy into that. Then what is his argument? He says that um, this world is not real. It's an appearance of Brahman. Brahman did not give rise to a real world. That's his argument. What's it like? Example is the dream example. Where you see people and events happen, you go to places, time, space, people, objects, everything seen in a dream. When you wake up, what do you say? Oh, it was a dream. It was all in my mind. It was not really. I did, did not actually go to those places. I did not actually meet those people. I did not actually eat that food. It was all my mind. Though I experienced it all, but I know it's not real. Why? It was nothing apart from my mind. Similarly, Gaurapada says, very carefully here, many people think that Gaurapada said that the, this world is also a projection of the mind. He doesn't mean to say that. He says this world is imagined in consciousness just as your dreams are imagined in your mind. Dreams are projection of the mind, nobody denies. This world is experienced in consciousness and is nothing apart from consciousness. That is the conclusion of Gaurapada based on the dream example. Then he introduces a curious example, which is the reason for the name of the chapter. He says, take a firebrand. You know what a firebrand is? Like a, like a glowing piece of charcoal. And you swing it around in various shapes, you know, circles and patterns. And you will see glowing patterns in the, especially if at night, you get a wonderful display of patterns in, in, the, sky, in the sky when you swing it around. Circles and whatnot, and ellipses and... So, but those are not there. They are illusions because of that point of light. Exactly like that, he says, because of consciousness, we have the experience of a universe which actually does not exist in itself. When you realize this, he calls it Alata Shanti. Alata means firebrand. Alata Chakra, firebrand circle. So th that's the example he uses. And quenching the firebrand, if you put the firebrand in water, it hisses and goes out. 
So quenching the firebrand is you, you put this whole idea of the origination of the universe. It's like the whirling the firebrand. It's the circle of the firebrand. You put it in the cooling water of the knowledge of which Gaurapada is offering and it hisses and goes out. And you realize it was not there at all. So that's the example. And that's why the name has come. Alata Shanti uh, pr uh, Prakarana. Quenching the firebrand or the cessation of the whirling of the firebrand. Now that, that still leaves one question. That Gaurapada, oh Gaurapada, your own Upanishads, your Vedantic. So your own Upanishads, they talk about the origin of the universe. Taittiriya Upanishad says, Tasmad Tasmad Atmana Akasha Sambhuta. From this very Atman, from this very consciousness, space and air and fire and water and earth were produced and by the mixture of the five elements this universe was produced. The unit, your own Upanishads talk about the origination of the universe. So how do you explain that? You can't say they are wrong and Gaurapada has to toe a very careful line here. If he cuts those down, then he has cut down his own root. You know the famous story? I think it refers to Kalidas or somebody who, the great poet who was a dud before he became a great poet. He was sitting on a branch of a tree and, and, and then cutting the branch. You know, like he was sitting facing the tree and the branch is here, cutting the branch itself. <laughs> so he would fall down. Now he can't cut down the Upanishads because he is, uh, he is after all a Vedantin. What he says is, that's a standard e explanation that we have in Vedanta, is that the Upanishads give you a graded answer. Straight away, if you are told, there is no world, it's only Brahman, we are left high and dry. The world is all we know. And Brahman is something we don't understand. How are we to ever understand this kind of a theory? It seems too radical. Now if they introduce, here is the world, don't worry, here is the world. Okay, I'm happy. Now just think, that the world has a cause, it is called Brahman. It works, that classic example of the clay pot. You have a pot. Really it is clay. If somebody, and if I, did, if I do not know what clay is, if somebody comes to me and says that you don't have a pot, there is no pot. I am holding a pot. What do you mean there is no pot? The way to convince me would be, you would say, look, here is your pot. Be happy with it. No problem. I am not taking it away from you. Oh, good. Let me clutch my pot. And then, now think. This pot has a cause. It originated from its cause. I see. What is the cause? I have got the pot. I am safe. The pot is safe. What is the cause? The cause is clay. The material out of which the pot has come. So the cause is clay and the effect is pot. Okay, I get, get it. Oh, very nice. Where is the clay? Look at the pot. It's okay. The top is clay. The bottom is clay. Inside is clay. Outside is clay. What you are touching is clay. What you weigh is the clay. In fact, through and through it is clay alone. Okay, I see. Oh, so this is clay. Now think, if it is through and through clay alone, there is no such thing called the pot. You are not holding a pot, you are holding clay. Then what is a pot? It's a name. It's a particular form. It's a particular use. Nama, Rupa, Vyavahara in Sanskrit. But it's not a thing. It's not a substance. It's not a reality in itself. If you argue, if I argue, no, alright, I get it. There is clay, but as you said, there is a form. So the form is also there, right? No, the form is not there in the sense that the clay is there. Because if you take the clay away, the form will not be there. Clay can exist without the form. But the form cannot exist without the clay. Just think about it. The form of a pot. Can it exist without the clay, constituent clay? No. Can the clay exist without the pot? Yes. If it was not, if it was a lump of clay before it was a pot. If you break the pot, it will be pot shirts, broken uh, pieces of a pot. So it will not, the pot depends on the clay. The clay does not depend on the pot. The pot is not a reality in the sense the clay is a reality. Clay alone is real. Pot is an appearance of the clay. Pot real, pot satyam. No, clay satyam, pot mithya. And not that jiva is clay alone. Yet you are the clay alone. No, I'm not saying that. The clay alone is real. The pot is an appearance thereof. We come to that conclusion. If you come to that conclusion, it's alright. 
What Gaudapada is objecting to is, if you stop halfway, if you say, there is clay, the cause of the pot, there is something called a pot and something called clay and the clay has caused a pot. If you stop there, Gaudapada objects to it. You can never demonstrate two things causally linked. There is no real causation there. What you did was, you used the theory of causation. The pot is an effect, clay is a cause, investigate it. Using the cause-effect relationship, you will end up with clay alone. And then cause-effect relationship is given up. Because clay did not actually produce a pot. There is no effect called a pot. Are you following me? There is no real effect called a pot. So there is no real causation involved. But the theory of causation was used for what? For going from the pot paradigm to the clay paradigm. What is the use of going from the pot paradigm to the clay paradigm? The clay paradigm is real, is more real, is real compared to the pot paradigm. I am having a good time, I hope. <laughs> huh. But if you stop halfway in between, there is something real called clay. Somebody wrote an email to me. It, unless you think it through, it will appear like that. You know, Swami, I used to think it was a pot, but now you say it's clay, I realize that. But it's, still, it seems to me there are two realities, clay and pot. Somebody wrote an email to me. There are not two realities. How can you prove it? Simple. I'll keep the clay, you keep your pot. <laughs> for pot and clay, it might not make so much a difference. If it's a golden uh, necklace, for example, I'll keep the gold, you keep the necklace. No, it will not work. There is no separate thing called a pot. If you stop there, clay and pot, clay is real, pot is also real. Then this is what Alan Watts calls, calls the crackpot theory. <laughs> crackpot theory. And exactly Gaudapada agrees with him. Or rather we should say Alan Watts agrees with Gaudapada because Gaudapada was 14 centuries before Alan. He, he says this does not stand. But the theory of causation can be used to investigate and come to the understanding that it is consciousness alone. All right. <laughs>